Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my talk, The Well Beyond the Phone, Exploring ARKit. A few months ago at WWDC, Apple unveiled ARKit, bringing augmented reality to everyone. Apple calls it a framework that allows you to easily create un uh, unparalleled augmented reality experiences for iPhone and iPad. By blending digital objects and information with the environment around you, ARKit takes apps beyond the screen, freeing them to interact with the world in entirely new ways. But firstly, who am I? My name is Patrick, and I'm a student at the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm also a two-time WWDC scholarship recipient, and I have almost no background in augmented reality and close to none in 3D graphics. But I spent the winter studying it because I'm fascinated with alternate human-computer interactions, like the leap motion here. I think AR has the potential to fundamentally change the way we interact with computers, and I want to be at the front of that. Uh, as noted in the title of this talk, this is an exploration of ARKit. This is not a deep dive. And while we're getting disclaimers out of the way, much to my disappointment, there wasn't really any good way to fit any aha kit jokes into this presentation. <laughs> so that will be all of them. OK, this morning we're going to cover off four main sections, starting with how we got here. There's been a lot of hype around AR in the last few years, thanks especially to the insane success of Pokemon Go. Augmented reality has promised to be the future of computing for a few years now, but it's got a far more lengthy history. In 1968, the first head-mounted display system, named the Swords of Democles, was made at Harvard University. In 1990, Boeing researcher Tom Caldwell coined the term augmented reality. And AR technology has mostly been out of the reach to the common developers throughout the decades, and so it's been explored almost solely by universities, government agencies, and attached institutions. In 1993, the US Air Force had their second attempt at making an augmented reality goggle rig called Karma, and Karma used, again, a see-through head-mounted display to facilitate the maintenance of laser printers. Yeah, like how to put paper in. Uh, to be honest, I found this kind of funny, but it does seem like the perfect use case for augmented reality. In 1998, the first in 10 computer system was broadcast by Sports Vision, projecting the yellow down line during NFL game. Uh, today, almost all sports use augmented reality, and for us, this would be the most familiar use of AR in our lives. We know modern augmented reality thanks to the 2013 Google project, Glass. Uh, it was mostly a failure in the consumer space, but it did provide us what a modern head-mounted AR system could look like. More recently, we have a push in mobile AR with Facebook announcing their platform earlier this year, uh, and Google have their project, Tango. Lastly, we also know it thanks to the stupid dancing hot dog in the latest Snapchat app. OK, but that's enough about the others. We're going to look at ARKit. So let's look at the theory behind augmented reality and how it applies to AR. So what is AR? Well, augmented reality is creating the illusion that virtual objects are placed in the physical world using a camera. Uh, but definitions are cool, but let's look at the actual components to make up an augmented reality system. ARKit is a visual inertial odometry system, VIO, uh, with some 2D plane detection thrown in on the side. VIO means using visual and using sensor systems to estimate the change in position over time. Now, using VIO, ARKit continuously tracks your position, known as your six degrees of freedom pose. Six degrees of freedom means traditional uh, X, Y, and Z motion, known as translation, and 3D pitch, yaw, and roll, known as your rotation. To get your pose, iPhone runs simultaneous tracks through the camera and the internal sensors. Using the visual system, points in the real world are matched to corresponding pixels in the camera. Secondly, the internal inertial system tracks you using the accelerometer and the gyroscope, and this is called the, internal me the inertial measurement unit, or IMU. ARKit then combines both of these using data streams using an algorithm known as a Kalman filter to produce the ground truth, or for all intents and purposes, this is like our real position as far as us as developers are concerned. 
Now, VIO has some great advantages over using just visual or just inertial systems. Uh, this is because the IMU readings are taken at about 1,000 times a second, uh, but the visual is only taken at the frame rate of the camera. The system then uses dead reckoning or best guess to estimate distances and the position. What's so cool about this is both components do accumulate errors and drift over time. The inertial systems in our iPhones are very prone to drifts as time goes on, but using VIO, the visual system can effectively reset the inertial system each time a frame is read. The visual system works in difference in distance, effectively how far a group of pixels have moved from one frame to the next. But obviously this can cause problems if you move quite fast as a, as a point can enter and leave before it's been fully tracked. So the faster you travel, obviously the worse the visual tracking becomes. Using VIO, these two systems sampling at different rates, we can counter the errors in both. And this is great because we can use one system to cancel the weaknesses of the other and vice versa. Along with VIO, the other component of ARKit is plane detection. Plane detection is what actually allows us to place objects in the real world. The optical system detects features in a plane. Uh, when you have three features, it can work out this is a plane. And when you have a whole bunch of these, you produce a sparse point cloud and you can determine what is a horizontal surface. Now, in my research, I came across this article, which I assume a lot of you have probably read. It's done the rounds like five or six times uh, by Matt Meisnix. And he asked two key questions. How do you get 3D from a single lens? And the second one, how do you get a metric scale, like in this tape measurement demo? Uh, the first one made by a fellow Patrick, a friend of mine, Patrick Ballastra. And it demonstrates like, just how accurate ARKit can be. To answer the second question, Matt says the secret is to have really, really, really good IMU error removal, i.e. making the dead reckoning in the accelerometer data really, really good. To answer the second question, he says that to get 3D, you have to have two views of a scene, right? You need stereoscopic calculation of your position. And this is how our eyes see in 3D and why some trackers rely on stereo cameras uh, it's easy to calculate if you have two cameras because they can capture at the same time and you already know the distance between them. Super simple maths. But when you only have one camera, what you need to do is you capture one frame and then you move and you capture the second frame. And then you have to use IMU calculations to work out the distance between the two frames and the time between those two frames. And then you can do your stereo calculation as normal. So to Ultimately, the reason ARKit actually works is because Apple took the time and the effort to tightly couple their VIO algorithms to the sensors and spend a lot of time calibrating them. And that's why it ultimately ended up being better than, say, Tango, where Google can't do that. OK, so all the conceptual stuff is cool. But let's explore it in relation to ARKit and the fact that I assume we're not like VIO mathematicians and we really don't care about that stuff. Firstly, reminder, ARKit runs on A9 capable devices and higher. Uh, there was like a little bit of weird support before beta 6 where you could actually run it, but they've locked that down now. So there's three main capabilities to ARKit. Tracking, scene understanding, and rendering. Tracking. ARKit tracks your position in real world space in real time. It's the VIO stuff we just covered. Uh, the things you need to note, though, is physical distances are measured in meters, and the coordinate system is relative to the starting point of your session. ARKit is spatially aware, and it has the ability to detect horizontal planes, the plane detections. Uh, and this is horizontal planes with respect to gravity and not with respect to your phone. Scene uh, understanding also allows us to do things like hit testing and light estimation. Thirdly, rendering. It provides us an easy way to render content in 3D space. This is the cool bit. It has direct integration into SpriteKit, SyncKit, and Metal, and also with third-party engines like Unity and Unreal. OK, rendering. This is actually what we care about. So how on earth do we get all that math stuff from before into our app and draw something? Before getting too dirty, there's just a couple more points about ARKit we need to cover. The six key components. 
sessions. iOS is full of session-based frameworks, so I'm sure we all kind of understand how they work. And to get a session working requires an AR configuration to be passed in, and then it does the bulk of the work. And there's two ways. You can either poll for updates or more likely subscribe to the delegate. That configuration that we pass in has two subclasses. Uh, just a point of note, in beta 5 or 6, the previous configurations were deprecated and we have new configuration classes. So be careful when you're following A, the old dub dub talks, and B, old tutorials. The AR configuration is an abstract class. It has two subclasses depending on what you want to use. And then you set up the configuration, you pass it into your run options, and that's really all you have to do. AR, configurations to, uh, AR configuration allows you to set things like whether you want to do light estimation, whether you want to capture audio in the session, and whether you, uh, what type of world alignment you want. You also use this to check whether the current device actually supports the session type that you want. Because the two session subclasses are AR world tracking, AR world tracking configuration, and this provides the nice, high-quality experience that we've been talking about with full hit testing, plane detection, the ability to walk around. The other is AR orientation tracking configuration. And this provides a very basic AR experience, and it really should only be used as a fallback. AR orientation tracking configuration class tracks the device's movement with only three degrees of freedom, as opposed to six. And these are just the roll, yaw, and pitch and it doesn't support plane detection or hit testing. This configuration can't track the movement of the device, and so it means that your, your rendering often will appear to drift because it only tracks as though the device was in a singular position. So Apple suggests that because three degrees of freedom tracking is a really limited and not that enjoyable experience, that you shouldn't use this directly, and you should instead check whether six degrees of freedom is available only use this as a fallback where it's applicable for your app. The next is frames. An AR session uh, runs, you can access an AR frame for information. It contains the captured image, the detailed tracking, the scene understanding, uh, and the current lighting conditions. This is kind of everything you need to know how to render your content. Feature points are a list of real world tracking points gathered by ARKit, uh, and they relate to trackable features in the world. These provide you with the depth information uh, and give it the spatial aware capabilities. Anchors are uh, then uh, the position and orientation in real world space. And you can create an anchor and then place it in and it uses the feature points to work out where it's going to be. Anchors are guaranteed to stay where they are, well, as close as they can, to where they are throughout the duration of the session, whereas feature points come and go depending on lighting conditions. Uh, planes, we've covered that. We should really know what they are. The only thing you need to know is a plane is accessed through an AR plane anchor, which is a subclass of an anchor. Uh, and lastly, lighting. AR kit tracks current lighting conditions, which can be used to properly light virtual content in a more believable fashion. Awesome. OK. So it seems like a few things to manage. There's a lot of stuff, but it really is quite simple. And AR kit does most of it for you. So let's quickly walk through some code, uh, yay, code. <laughs> some background. Uh, one of my active hobbies is filmmaking. I've been making films for like a decade, uh, but these days, rather than making fictional films to be played to audiences, instead I switched to vlogging, because that's what everybody else does. Uh, while over the years I've used a lot of different equipment, uh, nearly everything I shoot these days is mostly on an iPhone. Uh, an iPhone is the most prevalent camera in the YouTube space. And while brainstorming ideas, I thought of titles. Titles are really important in films, uh, like way more than people realize. And a lot of filmmakers like to put titles inside the scene. It's a great way of conveying information. But it's really difficult if you're a beginner filmmaker or you have no experience with 3D tracking, with compositing and After Effects and using Mocha and things like that, of which these titles we use uh, composited with Mocha. Well, tracked with mock and composite in After Effects. So let's walk through ARKit and we'll try and make some titles for my next vlog, which I should release in about three days. So this is all we need to do to get something up and running. We create the session, we set ourselves as a delegate, 
We set up which configuration we want, we run it, and that's it, the end. Not quite. This doesn't actually render any content on the screen for us. So the simplest way to render is to use an Xcode template. I've set mine up with SyncKit here, uh, and this will be the framework I suspect most of us will use because it allows us to do both 3D but also stay in the Apple technology stack. Uh, obviously, Unity is a great choice if you know any Unity, but that's an entirely separate stack. So, uh, and we'll touch back on SpriteKit as we go through. This generates a nice, massive view controller uh, that's actually on the 81 lines, and most of it's white space, most of it's comments, so it's really not that massive. Uh, and that's all you need to do. The dem demo then provides you with this uh, scene object, which just puts a spaceship in front of you. It's like, you're done, right? There's, there's no more to do after this. Um, but that's cool. Like, who wants to hear a spaceship app? I'm sure someone will try and release this to the App Store come September. <laughs> um, but we want to do more than that, right? So the first thing we need to do is obviously adhere to the AR scene view delegate. Uh, the cool thing about this is it allows us to interact, obviously, with our AR scene view, which we need to hold on to. The great thing about the AR scene view is it handles all of the AR kit delegation for us, so we don't have to. If you want to, you can also adhere to the AR kit delegate, but there's really no reason to. Uh, if you wanted to use Sprite kit, you can just use the AR SK view instead. So all we need to do then is we set ourselves as a delegate, we create a scene, and here we're just importing a pre-made scene, uh, and then we set the scene property to the scene of our scene view. Too many scenes. Uh, and then finally, we create the configuration and we run it like before. Very, very simple. Bob's your uncle. You have this wonderful spaceship app. Hmm. Not quite. It's a bit more involved in making something actually useful. Uh, and rather than like demo and get stuck in the fact that one, this room is too dark for AR kit, and two, no one wants to watch as Swift fails to compile. Uh, I figured I'd show you a finished product and we'll work backwards from there. So this is the intro of what will hopefully be my vlog come the end of this week. Um, so let's walk through the code to get that working. It's pretty simple. Really, we're just rendering some text in 3D space, but once you understand how to do that, you could render anything there, and that's the point. So firstly, created a couple more variables to hold on to things like our scene text, which is just a geometry object, our title node, which is actually what gets rendered, and just a string and some overlays. Uh, and then in our view did load, uh, this is all the stuff that was created from the Xcode template, so I just change it out to use an empty scene instead. Logically, if you were building something slightly more complex than this, you would subclass the scene, but this is not a lesson on scene kit. That is an entirely separate world. Uh, I've created this function, which is quite important. It's to allow us to check which configuration is available to us. In my case, I decided that if we don't have six degrees of freedom available, we will fall back. Uh, if you look at the Apple demo that they released after DubDub, instead here they display an error message to the user and tell them that the app isn't going to work at all because they were using plane detection and plane detection is not available in three degrees of tracking and so they just error out. That's a decision for you as the app developer to work out can it work with limited experience? If it can, you should choose that because it'll allow everyone to be able to use it. If not, then unfortunately you just have to fail like Apple does. Uh, and then this tells the session to run. Um, here, the main difference over the original Xcode template is we've got our reset tracking and our remove existing anchors. And this is because at any point I might call this. Uh, I have a button in the app that allows you to reset the tracking. And since the session's already running, this is to then remove all of the existing uh, tracking points, because you, in some instances, may want to keep them around. If you're only starting the session once, it's unnecessary to do this. There's no tracking points when you already start. 
Uh, and then ignoring discussions about whether this is the best way to intercept touches or not, or if gestures or whatever are better. Uh, let's intercept a touch because we want to place something when user interacts. We only want one touch. Again, we're not here to critique how terrible I am at UIKit. Um, and this is because I've hidden some interaction behind other gestures. Uh, and then we grab our point of view. And this is the way that our camera is looking at the time in the world. Uh, and we want this because we want our text to face us when we place it and not face the origin of the scene kit world. Then I'm just removing the other nodes because I'm lazy and I can't be bothered to keep the old ones around and be bothered to come up with a way to delete them. But it's quite trivial to hit test a node and use that as a way of deleting it. Uh, and then still inside this real world vector method that I created. Uh, it's a function that allows you to get the coordinates of any point on a screen. And it just takes the hit test away from us. So we're running the hit test and we're asking for a feature point. Here you can also ask for, again, like we discussed, the AR plane anchor type, uh, which can get you either get existing planes or new planes. Feature point is going to be your widest cast net. It will get any feature point it can find. Doesn't guarantee it to be a plane. Um, and then we are converting that to a scene vector 3, which is a vector in scene kit. Uh, we need to convert that because it comes in as a matrix float 4x4. Four four. Um, I'll be honest, I got a little lost in this stuff. And so I think it's easier if you just do this every time. And it just takes the third column in the matrix. I, I don't know. I, I dropped out of maths. Um, and then we get the vector back, and we check, do we actually get something back? If not, the hit test failed. We can display an error message to the user that there was no feature at the point in which we passed the hit test in. Um, here, I'm quite literally just passing it into the center of the frame. Or you could take the x, y coordinates of your touch, which is probably more common use case. Uh, I'm creating a scene text, which is a geometry type, and the extrusion depth. The extrusion depth is in scene kit units, which in a normal scene kit world is just some like magic units. In our world, it's meters. So I'm saying it's going to be five meters deep. Um, and then we're setting the size, again, which is in scene kit units. So if I was to render this right now, my text would be 30 meters high. Um, but the reason we do this is because of the way that the scene kit geometry works. It renders a uh, calculation of the number of polygons that it needs. So if we were to set it to say what we actually wanted, which is like 60 centimeters, it would look horrible because it would use so few polygons. So the standard method here is build it really big. Uh, and then once we assign it to the node and down here, we actually just scale it all the way back down to 30 centimeters again. Um, and this is the way most people do it to allow you to render stuff at a resolution that makes sense and then scale it back down because everything is in meters. Uh, this world position is the vector that we got earlier. So that's the actual point in the space that we're going to render it. And as we discussed, we're grabbing the point of view and the rotation because we want it facing us, which makes the most sense in this use case. Text node center is just a little scene kit hack. If you've ever worked with text in scene kit, you'll understand that its uh, coordinate system is quite weird. Uh, and so all it does is just find the bounding box and recenter the text again, because even though SyncKit supports text alignment, like you know, NX text alignment center, whatever, um, it ignores all of it. So you have to do this manually. Uh, and then we just add it to the node, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, you get it's now rendered into the scene. Um, I put a few uh, UIKit elements over the screen so I could interact with it. Um, I've got a does not display on these projectors, um, a little target in the middle so I knew where the middle of the screen was, where the things would be. Um, this is just a button to allow me to change the text, a label to show the error messages to myself because you never know when you can't find a scene, when, light estimate, uh, when the light in the room is too dark or anything like that, uh, and then a slider to allow me to scale the text. Um, the button just calls a function that asks to change the title and it just displays an alert because we're lazy, we're developers, not designers. Um, sorry, Mark. And then uh, I just update the title, recenter the title because we have to get around that stupid thing in SyncKit not centering titles. Uh, and then I'm just saving the string again for myself. Now this slider, uh, again, all I'm doing is telling the node 
uh, to recalculate its scale based on, again, that's 10 centimeters, which is our scale value, and then multiplying it by whatever the slider is. So it can range anywhere from effectively zero centimeters to about 60 centimeters tall. Uh, and pretty much ignoring a couple other small changes that have no bearing on AR kit, like adding replay kit so I could actually record it, uh, then clicked with me later, I could just use iOS 11 screen recording. But anyways, um, that's it. If we look at the original clip, uh, all you need to do is tap, it places it in the world, use the slider to scale it to the height you want, uh, and then that's, that's it. It's really, really, really quite simple. Um, once you've done that, you can place anything in the world. And it doesn't have to be on a tap. You can place it when you create the world, like we did with the rocket. Uh, ARKit does everything you need for you. So that's about it. Uh, ARKit's really easy. The hardest part is the rendering. It's the scene kit, it's the sprite kit, or Unity Unreal Engine stuff. Um, if you want to look at it, look into Apple's demo. That uses all scene kit. And they do a heaps more with the actual exploration of the way that SceneKit works. Um, I, again, as I said, I've touched Unity once to build some chemistry stuff. So the AR kit component is incredibly easy, the SceneKit less so. Uh, so this morning, we've explored a fair amount. The world of augmented reality, uh, as you know, is ripe to step into. September. When, it launch, when ARKit launches, there's going to be tons and tons of apps out there, and it really is quite easy to use. Thanks. Uh, I'll be around the conference if you want to point out mistakes in my typos and stuff like that, uh, or just say hi. Cheers.